Welcome to Table Talk with Paula and Libby. Please join our host, Paula Arnold. Our co-host, Libby Patton. For the next two weeks, we have a special treat for you. Pastor Libby Patton will be sharing the word that she brought to a recent women's conference. The title, Swimming in the Prophetic. But see, the Lord is real gracious to me because I love to sleep. For me, from the hours of 5 a.m. to about 10 a.m. are like gold. I mean, to me, that's just when it's nice and cool, and I just love to just snuggle up with my pillow, and sometimes I'll put some worship music on, and I'll sleep, and River likes to sleep too, so we got a real good partnership going on at the house. But this morning was a little different, and God woke me up this morning, and um, I'm going to read to you what he told me. Because I had to write it down immediately because I thought, if I don't write this down and I go back to sleep, I will not remember it. So this is what he said to me. What looks great on the outside could be broken on the inside. One of the biggest lies the church has bought into is let's fake it till we make it. Now, I don't know about you all, but where I was raised in a charismatic church, that was the thing. Girl, just fake it till you make it. Just put on your best outfit, put on your best shoes, put your makeup on. Our pastor actually used to say, every, every old barn needs a good coat of paint. Well, I didn't really like that saying because I wasn't old at the time. I was kind of young. <laughs> and, and I did wear a lot of makeup, and I did put on the finest of clothes that I could. Yes, if you want to turn those on. I did put on the finest of clothes that I could possibly buy at that time because, you know, the church that I went to, the ladies dressed nice, and they always had these really cool shoes. I mean, shoes that sparkled and, and were like, six inches high and I thought how do they walk in them things you know and I would try to wear them and I would wear all the fancy clothes until finally one day I was like I can't keep doing this just give me some shorts and a t-shirt and my converse and let me rock Jesus the way I know how to rock him you know, that's all I knew to do you know I mean I, I tried to be the stigma I tried because see what was going on ladies is they were dressing up really good on the outside but what was going on on the inside was broken and it was a mess and you know sometimes we have to come to God that way we do and I don't think God cares so much about what you're wearing I don't I don't think he cares I don't think he cares if you got your flip-flops on or if you got your Daisy Dukes on uh, I mean let's not show our mm-hmm's but you know. <laughs> but if you're out by the pool there's appropriate places to wear your Daisy Dukes and there's appropriate places to wear you know your your little knee shorts and you know, so let's be appropriate, ladies. But what I'm saying is we pay so much attention to what's going on on the outside that we forget to look about what's going on on the inside on somebody. I've come into this church many times. I did a little test one time. And I came in and I slammed the door and I bolted back to my office, which was back there back then, and I just wouldn't speak to anybody. Everybody just kind of was like this, you know. And, and Paula got up on the congas and she was playing. And I told Janessa, I said, go up there and tell her to quit playing them daggum congas. I'm just, it's distracting me. She was like, okay. So she comes out and she tells Paula, listen, Pastor Luby said, please stop doing that. You're really bothering her. Paula's like, okay. You know. I come out and everybody's real quiet. And they're all kind of like, they didn't know what to do. You know, they didn't know whether to be happy or to be sad or to praise the Lord. And some people were real confused and because they'd never seen me act that way. Some people actually talked about me and said some mean things about me. They, they admitted it later, you know. I said, that was brave. Because I was ready to lay hands on somebody. And I got up behind the pulpit and I just started busting out laughing. And they were like, I said, well, some of you passed the test and some of you failed the test. Because I like to stay in my love bubble. I like to let what goes on on the inside of me have projection on the outside of me. Because I believe that is the grace of God on my life. See, the grace actually means the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in your life. So we've been taught that grace means favor unmerited favor and it does mean that but you know that's at the last of the definition that's not even at the beginning the beginning of that definition is the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in your life I like to think that as often as I can 
I allow that grace to come out of me, to flow out of me to other people because it's what God gave me. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And I want all the Jesus that I can get. So then after everybody figured out who'd passed and who'd failed the test, <laughs> I said, you need to stop and think just for a moment, ladies. We can, we can look real good. We can smell real good. We can wear the right shoes. And, and we can have the right hairdos and have our nails all pretty and sparkly. But you don't know what's going on with somebody on the inside. So if somebody does come in in a bad mood, just love on them. Say somebody does come in, you know, and they're just, they're broken. And you can tell, I mean, you've got the spirit of discernment on the inside of you. And you're thinking, wow, they're being a little short with so-and-so, but there must be something going on because I know that's not who they really are. They're a child of the most high God. So what can I do to help them, Father? Sometimes God will say, just leave them alone. <laughs> Sometimes God will say, give them a hug. Sometimes God will say, just say something sweet to them. Tell them you love them. Tell them I love them. Because they might not hear that enough. Sometimes we don't hear it enough. So I want to encourage you, ladies, because that's not all that God told me. But I want to encourage you with that little tidbit that he woke me up with this morning. Don't be so quick to judge the outside from what's going on on the inside. He also told me this, and I'm going to share a little story. Uh, back in April, I was invited to come to an apostolic women's conference in Pensacola, Florida. And I thought, oh, wow, what a great honor. Yes, I would love to come. And, and you know, and I, I paid my, my uh, ordination fees and, and uh, we packed up our bags, got our hotel room, got on the jet airplane, and we was high timing it going to Pensacola, you know, and having a good time. And I get there and had a week full of conferences, and we were hooping and hollering and praising the Lord, and the worship was awesome, and the Word was great, and it was just a phenomenal time. And so it got ready to be ordination time. And I was like, oh, I'm so excited, you know. So I, I'm going in. There's like 300 women that are getting ordained at the same time. And I thought, how are they going to do this? Well, they, they, they did it. It was crazy how they did it, but they did it. So I was waiting patiently for the apostles to come and to lay their hands on me. I was so excited. I was thinking, God's going to say something miraculous to me. It's just going to floor me. I'm going to be laid out in the spirit, and I'm just going to get all this revelation, and it's going to be life-changing for me. And here he comes, and he lays his hands on me, and he spoke a word in tongues, and then he moves away. And I'm standing there. Hello? <laughs> God. <laughs> I thought, okay, did, did I miss the boat? <laughs> so I just go down on my knees and I'm just sitting there and I put my hands on the floor and I said, Lord, what happened? And he spoke this to me. And I was like, he said, not everything that glitters is gold. I said, God, that's a secular saying, really? How many of y'all talk to God like that? I mean, am I the only one? <laughs> I'm like, you didn't even say that. Somebody else said, Shakespeare said that. Come on, Lord. <laughs> Actually, God did say it. It's over in Proverbs somewhere. I can't remember. But anyway, <laughs> it's not exactly like that, but it's the same meaning. Because, you know, Shakespeare didn't get that. That wasn't an original thought. People don't have original thoughts. It's all God thoughts if it's good. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay. So I just kind of, you know, was looking around and all the other ladies were laid out and some were, you know, holy ghost in it and rolling around and I'm just kind of like, do something, you know, I mean, you know, throw me back or <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. And I said, okay, I'm going to take that word that you gave me and I'm going to go home and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to think about that. I'm going to meditate on that one, God. That's, that's deep. That's deep. I got something deep. I got, I, got a, I got a deep word. You know, so I go home and I'm, I go back to the hotel or the condominium and I'm sitting there and my little feet are propped up on the thing and I'm listening to the ocean and I'm like, so what about this glitter and gold thing, Lord? What, what are you trying to tell me here? I didn't hear anything for a few minutes. And God says, remember... When I told you that, and he, he gave me this revelation a long time ago. He, remember when I told you don't judge people by the way they look or don't judge a book by its cover because God spoke that to me once before too and I was like, yeah, I remember. He said, it's the same thing. 
You can be real sparkly on the outside, but be real dull on the inside. That is the reason why it's so important, ladies, to come together as, as women and in the body of Christ, because iron sharpens iron. When we're together, we sharpen each other. We exhort, we edify, we love, we encourage, we lift up one another. And that's what the body of Christ is all about. That's what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about bringing women together. We can sing psalms and hymns and love on each other. And that will bring life into that person. We are supposed to be fountains of life. If you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you, you are carrying a fountain of of life on the inside of you. So check what's coming out of your mouth. Check what you're thinking about. Check what you're allowing into your eye gates. Check what you're allowing into your soul to rummage around in there because you know that's where the devil's playground is. He loves to get us offended towards one another. He loves, you know, Emily doesn't really like me. She never hugs me when she comes in. And every time she looks at me, she rolls her eyes. <laughs> And oh, she just don't love me. And then you let that thought roll around in your head, and then you're over here, Jen. Have you, have you noticed that Emily just never hugs anybody? Once you, oh, really? Huh? Well, <laughs> that's a good response, though, because a lot of times the sister will say, I, you know, I've noticed that, and she never hugs me either. I wonder if something's wrong with her. I mean, we. We don't go there here. But there has been times when the enemy will play tricks on your soul to make you think that somebody's offended towards you, and they're really not. They're just, they're just going through a hard time. They're just having a bad day. Their kids are acting crazy. Their husband's an idiot. I mean, oh, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Scratch that. that that's not true. <laughs> and they just can't seem to get their thoughts together. And that's when I walk over to Emily and say, Emmy, I love you. You're my girl. Come here. Give me some love. <laughs> Broke that thing just like that. Because more than likely what's going on here is the, the enemy wants to stop a God partnership here. God has a work for me and Em to do. And the enemy doesn't want it to come forth. So he will feed me lies. He will make me think that she doesn't love me when all actuality, she's probably thinking, wow, I'm so excited that, that Libby wants to actually, you know, do something together. This is so great. We're going to have so much fun. And, you know, I don't know until I ask her. I don't know until I approach her. I don't know until I go and love on her. What's in her heart? Get to know the people around you. Get to know them. Reach out to them. The ministries of Paula Arnold are pleased to host the Kentucky Capitol Rotunda Prayer Conference. The next prayer meeting will be August 9th from noon to 1 p.m. Please join us as we pray for our leaders, our citizens, and for the whole Commonwealth of Kentucky. Hope to see you there. believe, if we can buy into the fact that whatever crosses our lips is a fountain of life, then that means that we are feeding eternal life into one another. That's God's word. That's God's word. Anything contrary to that does not bring life. It can bring confusion and it can bring strife and division and that's not who we are. So put a watch upon your tongue, note your confessions, that all things that you say produce eternal life to those who hear you. And this is where the glitter from gold comes from. It's kind of cute. It's from Proverbs 13, 7. One person pretends to be rich but has nothing. Another person pretends to be poor but has great wealth. See, I would much rather be spiritually wealthy I would, just, just like what you were saying, Pastor Michelle, I would much rather have the love of my Savior, knowing who I am in Christ, carrying that confidence of who he made me to be versus all the riches and gold that the world can offer me. And you say, oh, that's so cliche, Pastor Libby. You know that if you had a million dollars, 
Well, I'm just telling you, if I had a million dollars, I would first tithe. <laughs> and then I would give my offerings. <laughs> and then I would change that filter <laughs> in the air conditioner. <laughs> I'm so hot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to go to Isaiah. I want to get into something real quick that is going to carry a commission. And this is where the Lord wanted me to really press the prophetic. Because there's some things that God needs you to know as women of God that he says it's time for. And it's time to get off your bums. And it's time to do what God's been telling you to do, whether you want to do it or not. Because now's not the time to sit down. Now's the time to run with the vision that God's given you. The door has been swung wide open, ladies. It's wide open for you to run through it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a testimony. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting high upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Well, you know, back in 2006, I actually got hit by a train. My husband and I were traveling to Berea to take my daughter to family members' home. And my husband went to turn around because she forgot her phone in the car. And it was snowing real heavy, and he did not see the train track. He thought it was like a little pull-off area. So he pulled up to turn around to take the phone back to her. And about the time he pulled up, bam, I got hit on my side of the car. The train was coming at full speed. Well, I didn't see nothing coming but a bright light, and I thought I was on my way to heaven. You know, but I, I, I did die. And my husband knew that I had died. It knocked us so hard, praise God, it knocked us off the track. So Scott, looking at me, knowing there was no life in my body, laid his hand on me. He said, you will not die, you will live, and you will declare the works of the Lord. It took just a few seconds, and he kept saying it, but after that I started saying Jesus. Praise the Lord, that's all I was saying. <laughs> praise the Lord, I had Jesus in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept saying, Jesus, Jesus. They were cutting me out of the car. They said my seat was about six inches wide. So I knew that some things down here were broken. Because see, I had my prettiest outfit on. I had my big fluffy fur coat on. had my high heels on. My hair was done up pretty. I looked really good on the outside. But I was broken on the inside. To look at me, you'd have never thought there was anything wrong with me. Seriously, I did not have one scratch on my body. Not one scratch. Out of all the busted glass, at, according to how the train hit my door, it was like a V that went into my door. Should have cut me in half. I didn't have a scratch on my body. But I had four broken places in my pelvic. I had These ribs were all broken. This lung had collapsed. My shoulder was crushed. My larynx was torn. And they gave me 24 hours to live. This is after my husband revived me. And Scott said, Psh, no, you will live and not die. <laughs> and he will do, you ain't leaving me here with these kids. You know? <laughs> so they took me to the emergency room in Berea. My condition was too severe for them to handle me there, so they had to. They did inflate my lung. They did run a tube through my lung. And Scott said the whole time that you were on the the gurney, he said, you just kept saying Jesus. You just kept saying Jesus. And I can remember hearing everything that was going on around me, but I couldn't see anything because I had been knocked temporarily blind. There was a little knot on the side of my head right here where it hit my temple. So I was temporarily blind. And I could hear everything, but I couldn't see anything. And I just kept saying Jesus. Scott said it was the most inspiring thing I'd ever heard in my life. He said, you never stop saying Jesus. He said when they were putting that chest tube in, he said it literally looked like they were going to bring you off the table trying to get that tube in but between those broken ribs. He said, you just kept saying Jesus because they couldn't give me any pain medication. They didn't know how severe my brain trauma was. So then I go, they decide they're going to fly me to Lexington because they can't treat me there. So they fly me to Lexington. I get there. They immediately put me in ICU and they tell my husband she has 24 hours. The way her larynx is torn if any other fluids like blood or mucus get down in behind there, she could die instantly. Scott said, no. She will live and not die. And she will declare the works of the Lord. He sat by my bed the whole time and read the word to me. I was in and out of consciousness. I could hear every now and then. I could hear him saying things, and they went ahead and sedated me. 
My pastor at the time came in. He spoke life over me. They finally put me in another room. I did make it through the 24 hours. I got out of ICU after one day. <laughs> they put me in another room. And when I got to that room, here come the team of doctors to tell me everything that I was never going to be able to do again. I was like, okay. So I'm kind of in and out, you know, and they're saying, okay, she's got her broken this and broken that, and, and it'll be, you know, probably a year of therapy, and she'll be in a wheelchair for a while, and, and Scott just listened, and I just kind of half listened. And as they left the room, Scott said, what do you think about all that? I said, I don't think nothing about it. <laughs> Scott said, I'm calling our prayer team. And I said, okay. So we called the prayer team. I had somebody in my room 24-7 reading the word to me, speaking the word to me, singing over me, dancing over me for the entire 11 days that I was there. Finally, after the 11th day, they were like, look, we don't know what's going on. We knew what was going on. But we're going to have to send you home. And I was like, that's okay. Because they wanted to do surgery. And I didn't want surgery. Everybody was telling me you need to have surgery. We need to put these metal brackets in your pelvic and hold it together because it's not going to it's not going to go back together properly because it was the way I was hit my pelvic shifted sideways. So they did they said it will never line up unless we do surgery. Uh -huh. Okay. So they prepped me six times to go for an x-ray and every time that they were prepping me I couldn't eat. So they starved me for like six days in a row. <laughs> Finally, they, when they came back, they were like, look, we don't know what's going on, but we cannot get a clear x-ray. But my husband, the day they said they were going to start doing that, he said, do you want surgery? I said, no, God doesn't want me to have surgery. I don't want any metal in my butt. I got to travel, and I don't want to be setting every alarm off from here to Mexico and have to explain, yeah, I got screws in my butt, and, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to do that. That's not what needs to happen. So he said, all right. So he, my husband's kind of funny. So he lays his hands on me. He says, sprinkle, 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 sprinkle. And I was like, what are you doing? He said, I'm sprinkling Holy Ghost dust, angel dust all over you. He said, in the name of Jesus, Holy Ghost, you take care of that pelvic. So every time they would get an x-ray, it was all cloudy. <laughs> Seriously. Lewis says, they said, you've got this unusual gassy substance all in your pelvic down here. We just cannot get a clear x-ray. And without one, we can't do surgery. I said, well, huh. I said, well, I'll go home. He said, okay, we'll send you home. He said, you come back in two weeks, and then we'll, we'll try again. And I'm thinking, okay. So then I go home. The next day, there's a meeting in Lexington. Dr. Christian Harfush, you all familiar with him? He's an awesome prophet of God. He's an apostle, prophet of God. He was in Lexington. I go to this meeting. He preaches for three hours. I mean, I'm laying back here in this this wheelchair gurney that flips out and make the long bed and I, I take no pain medication because I'm like no I want to be totally coherent when he prays for me I don't want any substance any chemicals in my body I want to be totally I suffered <laughs> my ribs hurt so bad my hips were hurting my legs were hurt. I was like is he ever gonna get done preaching <laughs> just shut up and come lay hands on me please so then he finally at the end of his sermon he says is there anybody here that needs prayed for? <laughs> I'm laying on my bed. He said, you in the back. I said, <laughs> so he comes back there and he looks at me. He says, oh, Libby. I said, yes. He said, what do you want healed first? I said, these ribs, please. I said, my husband will not stop trying to make me laugh and it's driving me nuts. So he lays hands on my ribs and he speaks the word of God and he prays in tongues and those ribs were healed instantly. Instantly they were healed. I was so thankful, so thankful. He said, do you want to sit up? I said, yes, set me up. So he sits me up. He said, you want to walk? I was like, yes. Scott was like, no. <laughs> I said, shut up. Just roll me up there. So the whole time he's rolling me, he said, you know, if you get up and walk, the insurance is going to cancel everything. And I'm going to have to pay every one of these hospital bills. I said, you just, just step back and watch the miracle, okay? So he was like, I'm telling you, woman. <laughs> I said, just help me up there. So he gets me up there, and Dr. Christian um, is standing at the top. There's about three steps that you have to come up to the podium. And I'm at the bottom of them, and he reaches his hand down to me. And when he did that, 
I felt like it was Jesus himself saying, come on, come on, let's do this. And there was so much peace. There was, the room was entirely quiet. You could hear a pin drop. I know everybody's faith was so energized. They were just, I mean, they were just hanging on a miracle that was, that was getting ready to happen. And when he laid his hand down to me, I just grabbed his hand and I just went around on up the steps. And I took about four steps and I was standing there and I was looking at him. I was like, okay, now what? You know, he said, you need to go home and eat some ice cream. I thought, well, that's real spiritual. <laughs> but that's what he said to me. Because see, it's not always about this, this is God. I said walk. Sometimes God said, girl, go get you some ice cream because you got to gain some weight, you know. <laughs> you skin and bones. <laughs> and I, so that's what I did. I sat back down in my little wheelchair and I rolled home and I went home and had a tub of ice cream just like the prophet said. 